Welcome back, everyone. It is a beautiful spring day today. That gets me in the mood to get outside. Miracle of miracles. Clean the house. All those other spring-like things that give you the sense of renewal and all that. But I'm not quite ready to give up winter in that I'm still looking for the cozy things, the comforting things. So I'm looking for kind of a mixture of both. Also, I've been looking at my old uh, books a lot lately, so it occurred to me that this would be a good time to look over my old Winnie the Pooh books. The ones I have here are classic editions. They belong to my father, although I don't think they belonged to him when he was too young because it says here, original copyright 1926, then copyright renewal 1954, but it was reprinted in this format in 1961. My dad was 10 years old at that point and probably a little old for Winnie the Pooh. Um, so I think he may have gotten these when he was older. In any case, they are just beautiful classic editions and they're a little loved. I do have the covers, but those are even more loved. So we're just leaving them as they are. They both have pretty much the same cover so they're a little hard to tell apart at first glance. Uh, these are part of a set with the poetry books. Now we are six and it's precursor when we were very young. The book Winnie the Pooh has that classic Ernest Shepherd illustration, the map of the hundred acre wood. I love this so much. This particular copy also has you know when you're a kid and you don't quite understand you're not supposed to draw in books. Well, I gifted these to my kids and there's now a drawing that my eldest son made when he was young. <laughs> so he made his mark. He kind of added to the family um, legacy, as it were. So I didn't want to erase it because it might ruin the drawing, which it could argue it's already ruined. But then again, it's uh, it's original. But the drawing itself is just beautiful. When we first went ahead to have kids, I wanted a classic Winnie the Pooh theme for the nursery and, or kids' room, whatever you want to call it. So that's what we did. We painted it pale yellow. I put up uh, curtains I made in the classic Pooh um, design. And then there was a border around the room. It was all very light, very simple. I had wanted this map on one of the walls, but my husband thought it was too much. So we just took one of the illustrations and a friend painted it. And it was beautiful. It was very simple, very classic, very beautiful. These Ernest Shepherd illustrations are just adorable. They're iconic. They're on almost every page. The man was very busy. They're so iconic that Ernest Shepherd became very identified with these and he really started to resent it because he's like, well, what about my other work? You know, it happens to a lot of artists, unfortunately. He hit it big and then you're stuck with that one thing. And look at Star Trek and Leonard Nimoy and etc. Um, but then after a while, like Leonard Nimoy became okay with it and hopefully Ernest Shepard did too because this is work to be very proud of. I still love these books so much. A. A. Milne wrote quite a bit, quite a bit. He is, like Ernest Shepard, most identified with these books, and with good reason, because they are extremely good books. But A. A. Milne was very busy. He wrote plays and lots of other stories. I did read one of his plays. Um, I can't remember what it's called. I will link it down below. Um, it was very, it's very dated by now. It's about a couple, an unmarried couple, um, who move into an apartment and either she becomes pregnant or there's a rumor that she becomes pregnant and out of wedlock. Oh, man, very much, uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. That's the drama. Um, so yes, it's a bit dated by now. Um, still not a bad play, but it doesn't have, um, the, I hate to use the word iconic. It's overused, but, just the quality that makes it memorable, that makes it distinctive. That's a good word. Distinctive. So you really remember it and want to come back to it. 
Anyway, that's what these books have. They start out from the very beginning with Christopher Robin and his stuffed animal Winnie the Pooh. And that's how we are introduced, so that we understand that Christopher Robin is a little boy, Winnie the Pooh is a stuffed animal. That really introduces the idea that these are imaginary, made-up stories about Christopher Robin and his toys. And the formatting of the book contributes to that, because right from chapter one, which is the, the story of Winnie the Pooh uh, looking for honey and fighting off the bees, which many of us remember from Disney. The Disney cartoons also very memorable to many of us, um, although there are differences, and they didn't cover all the stories, of course. But we start out with the parent telling the story to Christopher Robin. Obviously, these were stories that A.A. Milne told to his son, Christopher Robin. And so he just goes ahead and writes it down as he told them to him. So we have the introduction where he's telling Christopher Robin the story, and then we switch to the story. But even in the story, we'll have Christopher Robin interrupting. We'll have the parent explaining something about the story. Then when Christopher Robin enters the story, the narrator switches to, um, I can never remember, I believe it's second person, where the narrator's talking directly to you, the person. You did this, you did that. And I'm going to do the voices, because I love doing the Winnie the Pooh voices. You may love it, you may hate it, but that's okay. Do your own voices. Read the book yourself, do your own voices in your head. So Pooh says, Yes, I just said to myself, coming along, I wonder if Christopher Robin has such a thing as a balloon about him. I just said it to myself, thinking of balloons and wondering, what do you want a balloon for, you said. So it goes along like that, having Christopher Robin being the you. This narrator is talking to you, who is Christopher Robin. It's a very interesting approach. It is only done with the first chapter. Um, probably because it would get old. But again, it introduces this entire concept that A. A. Milne's going with. It's a really neat approach, I think. The first chapter's fun, too, when it comes to the formatting of the book, at least for this page. And they played with that a little bit in the Disney cartoon, too. This part has, he climbed and he climbed and he climbed. And as he climbed, he sang a little song to himself. It went like this. So we're going right along the tree. He climbed and he climbed and he climbed. So we're going down, but you get the sense that you're climbing just the same. It's a very clever little formatting trick. Now again, I'm going to occasionally read parts of this because they are so much fun. Just the way he tells the story sometimes, the phrasing. Let's see here. This is a lovely bit of action. Who has climbed the tree and then he slips off? Oh, help, said Pooh, as he dropped ten feet on the branch below him. If only I hadn't, he said, as he bounced twenty feet onto the next branch. You see, what I meant to do, he explained, as he turned head over heels and crashed onto another branch thirty feet below, what I meant to do, of course it was rather, he admitted, as he slithered very quickly through the next six branches. It all comes, I suppose, he decided, as he said goodbye to the last branch, spun round three times, and flew gracefully into a gorse bush. It all comes of liking honey so much. Oh, help! I love that because it is a wonderful approach to action. It's very different. It works out loud. It works written. I love little, clever, different ways of telling a story. You can learn so much as a writer just by reading all these different ways of telling the story, right? It helps you find your own voice. On the same note, some of the ways he has the characters phrase things. Sometimes Pooh will say something like this. This is the part where he has visited Rabbit, he's eaten, he's gone to get out the way he came in and finds that he can't because he's stuck in the hole into Rabbit's den. Then Christopher Robin comes along. And he says, well, you're simply going to have to stay there for a couple of weeks and not eat anything. Of course, Pooh is a stuffed bear, not literally, but, you know, a, a pretend bear. So he'll be fine. And Christopher Robin offers to read to him to pass the time. So Pooh says, then would you read a sustaining book such as would help and comfort a wedged bear in great tightness? It's just 
that's the sort of thing that again it's it's memorable and it's a different way of putting things not just for the character but in general being the first book this one introduces us to several characters there's piglet being introduced in the next chapter then there's eeyore and eeyore has wonderful lines too for example and how are you said winnie the pooh Eeyore shook his head from side to side. Not very how, he said. I don't seem to have felt it all how for a long time. I'm not going to read all of Eeyore's lines, but it is tempting because he gets downright sassy at times. He'll give these little side, almost snide comments, um, and it just it injects that flavor. But at the same time, we can forgive him because he's Eeyore. He's my Eeyore. I've had him since before I can remember. His, one of his ears is inside out. I'm not sure why, but I love him so much. And not long after that, we are introduced to Owl. Now, we all have our favorite characters. Rabbit and Owl are probably mine because I think because they, um, they have their very, Rabbit especially, has his very specific idea of how things should work. And then Al can get very pompous and lecture and likes to drag out the big words. And I suppose maybe both those things remind me of myself. <laughs> For example, here we have Al, uh, right when Winnie the Pooh has come to visit him and we are meeting him for the first time. So Eeyore has lost his tail. Pooh has come to ask Al his advice of what to do for him. Well, said Al. The customary procedure in such cases is as follows. What does crust money per seed cake mean? said Pooh. For I am a bear of very little brain, and long words bother me. It means the thing to do. As long as it means that, I don't mind, said Pooh humbly. <laughs> there will be these little exchanges that just... I love them so much, these wonderful little bits of dialogue. And as a playwright, I especially, I really love good dialogue. At the same time, sometimes there are just parts that are so sweet. Eeyore, they find his tail, they bring it back, Christopher Robin nails it back on again, many of us know that part. Eeyore frisked about the forest, waving his tail so happily that Winnie the Pooh came over all funny and had to hurry home for a little snack of something to sustain him. Isn't that sweet? Oh my gosh. So there are a lot of things that happen in this book. There's the one where Eeyore has a birthday. Again, some great dialogue. Good morning, Eeyore, said Pooh. Good morning, Pooh Bear, said Eeyore gloomily. If it is a good morning, he said. Which I doubt, said he. I love that because not only is there what you are saying, but there's the little, the little bits he said, said he, in the middle. This is all part of the same paragraph, but it's differentiating the sentences. Like there are pauses, but not a big pause. It's all part of the same thought. Like I've said before, the way you tell the story can make such a difference. And then we're back to Al. This is uh, Eeyore's birthday. None of the other characters knew it was Eeyore's birthday. And Pooh finds out first, so he runs off to do something about it because they all love Eeyore and they want to show him. So he goes to Al, who is the only one of them who can spell. Even if he can't spell right, he can spell something. So Pooh goes off to ask Al, to write a happy birthday note. I'll insert a I'll insert a close up of this because you probably can't see it from here. So Al wrote, and this is what he wrote. Pooh looked on admiringly. I'm just saying a happy birthday, said Al carelessly. It's a nice long one, said Pooh, very much impressed by it. This book also introduces Kanga and Rue. Now at first Rabbit isn't too keen on Kanga and Rue. He feels that at this point they've got too many characters in the story, as it were. He thinks the forest is getting too crowded. 
he comes up with a plan to steal Baby Rue. Not really to steal him, of course, just to take him away from Kanga so that she can't find him, and maybe she'll decide that it's not a good place to live anymore. And this is where Rabbit really reminds me of me, because what does he do first? He makes a list. Plan to capture Baby Rue. 1. General remarks. Kanga runs faster than any of us, even me. 2. More general remarks. Kanga never takes her eye off Baby Rue, except when he's safely buttoned up in her pocket. 3. Therefore. If we are to capture Baby Rue, we must get a long start. Because Kanga runs faster than any of us, even me. C1. 4. A thought. If Rue had jumped out of Kanga's pocket and Piglet had jumped in, Kanga wouldn't know the difference because Piglet is a very small animal. 5. Like Rue. 6. But Kanga would have to be looking the other way first so as not to see Piglet jumping in. 7. C2. 8. Another thought. But if Pooh was talking to her very excitedly, she might look the other way for a moment. 9. And then I could run away with Rue. 10. Quickly. 11. And Kanga wouldn't discover the difference until afterwards. Of course, they don't keep Rue. They return and everything's worked out and it's fine. Um, but yes, Rabbit reminds me of me, not just for the list making, but he comes up with these ideas and does not let reality intrude a bit, at least in the planning stage. This is how it's going to go and no one will say him nay. When they go to put their plan into action, they find Kanga watching Rue as he plays. He is jumping around and falling into mouse holes. Kanga keeps saying, Rue, dear, just one more jump, and then we must go home. She says that again on this page. She says that again on this page. That is so true when it comes to being a parent. You say, okay, just one more time, then we're going. And then you get distracted a bit. Okay, just one more time, wrap it up. <laughs> You can't see, they're having so much fun playing that you don't want to just tell them, no, we've got to go. This one also has the expedition to the North Pole. Christopher Robin explains its expedition, but Pooh just can't seem to let go of the idea that it's called the expedition. There's another wonderful bit of dialogue. I can't resist. I have to read it. An ambush, said Owl, is a sort of surprise. So is a gorse bush sometimes, said Pooh. An ambush, as I was about to explain to Pooh, said Piglet, is a sort of surprise. If people jump out at you suddenly, that's an ambush, said Owl. It's an ambush, Pooh, when people jump out at you suddenly, explained Piglet. Pooh, who now knew what an ambush was, said that a gorse bush had sprung at him suddenly one day when he fell off a tree, and he had taken six days to get all the prickles out of himself. We are not talking about gorse bushes, said Owl, a little crossly. I am, said Pooh. I hope you don't mind me sharing too much dialogue. It's probably too much dialogue, but I, these little exchanges, I mean, I'm, I'm giggling as I read them. And they're also true to the individual characters. It's that interplay. This one also has the story where the rain, rain, rain came down, 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 and Piglet is entirely surrounded by water, being a very small animal. He can't figure out how to get out and save himself, so his friends have to come to his rescue. He does come up with the idea of writing a note in a bottle. That's how his friends realize he needs help, which is very smart of him. But it's also a very sweet part that just makes you go, oh, that's a bit of realness right there. He threw the bottle as far as he could throw. Splash! And in a little while, it bobbed up again on the water and he watched it floating slowly away in the distance until his eyes ached with looking. And sometimes he thought it was the bottle, and sometimes he thought it was just a ripple on the water which he was following. And then suddenly he knew that he would never see it again, and that he had done all that he could do to save himself. That's also, I only read part of it, but there's also a run-on sentence. There are a few of them in here, if you pay attention, just separated by commas, dashes, a semicolon, but it's a run-on sentence. If done properly, run-on sentences are fine. That's what the commas and dashes and semicolons are for to break it up. So it's not a run-on run-on. Um, but yeah, what your English teachers told you ain't necessarily so. You can break the rules in the right places. 
It just takes practice to figure out your narrative, the way you're telling the story, and figure out what's right for you, what rules are right to break. And Pooh comes up with the plan to save Piglet, which they do, and the very last chapter is a party to celebrate Pooh being awesome, basically. He's a, ve a bear of very little brain, but he does come up with some clever ideas. So again, this book is bookended by Christopher Robin being told the story. So at the very end of the party, we come back. And what did happen? asked Christopher Robin. When? Next morning? I don't know. And then we have to continue with the next stories, don't we? We have the promise of that going on. At the beginning, he comes downstairs. At the end, he goes back up the stairs. And in a moment, I heard Winnie the Pooh bump, 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 going up the stairs behind him. Exactly the way we began the beginning of the book. It's just a wonderful little enclosed story of stories. Now, of course, the book was so popular that there had to be a sequel, The House at Pooh Corner. This one does not have the map. This one has silhouettes of the characters playing in the Hundred Acre Wood, and I just love that, too. It's also got their names written as the characters might write their names, if they all could. It's also got a little property of stamp uh, with my dad's name. <laughs> this one begins with the house at Pooh, corner of the title. It's cold. It's so very cold. It's snow everywhere. Pooh is again wandering through the Hundred Acre Wood, and he comes upon Eeyore. Eeyore is out in the middle of the field where he lives in the snow and the cold. And Pooh realizes that Eeyore, as far as he knows, does not have a house. So he and Piglet take it upon themselves to build him one. There's another great bit of dialogue with Eeyore, who, it might be argued, looks on the bright side, if only in a snarky way. It's snowing still, said Eeyore gloomily. So it is. And freezing. Is it? Yes, said Eeyore. However, he said, brightening up a little, we haven't had an earthquake lately. I'm sorry, Eeyore, but I call that optimism. He's a realist and kind of down about the realism. But at the same time, hey, you haven't had an earthquake. There's always something good, right? This book also introduces Tigger. He looks a bit different than the one in the Disney, but a lot of them do. I love the introduction to Tigger. Hello, said Pooh, in case there was anything outside. Hello said whatever it was. Oh, said Pooh. Hello? Hello? Oh, there you are, said Pooh. Hello? Hello, said the strange animal, wondering how long this was going on. So if Tigger's your favorite and you've never read the original stories, you might be surprised at how little he's in it comparatively. You're going to have to wait till the second book to see him. And another little bit of delight. They're trying to find out what Tigger likes to eat. He claims he likes to eat everything, Tigger being Tigger. But then when he tries things one after the other, he finds he doesn't like them after all. So they go to Kangaroo's house. Pooh finds a small tin of condensed milk. And some people seem to tell him that Tiggers didn't like this. So he took it into a corner by itself and went with it to see that nobody interrupted it. Some of the other stories in here are searching for one of Rabbit's lost friends and relations. There's the one where Tiggers don't climb trees, in which Tigger finds that out by climbing a tree with Rue, and then he can't get down. Then there's Rabbit's busy day, in which he finds out what Christopher Robin does in the mornings, because he's not around then. Rabbit goes to visit Christopher Robin. When he gets there, there's a note on the door that says, Gone, G-O-N, out, Baxen, Bissy, B-I-S-Y, Baxen, C-R. So Rabbit, of course, takes it to Owl to try and decipher this complicated note. He shows it to Owl. Owl took Christopher Robin's notice from Rabbit and looked at it nervously. He could spell his own name, W-O-L, and he could spell Tuesday so that you knew it wasn't Wednesday. And he could read quite comfortably when you were looking over his shoulder and saying, well, all the time. And he could, well, said Rabbit. Yes, 
said Al, looking wise and thoughtful. I see what you mean. Undoubtedly. Well? Exactly, said Al. Precisely. And he added, after a little thought, If you had not come to me, I should have come to you. Why? asked Rabbit. For that very reason, said Al, hoping that something helpful would happen soon. Yesterday morning, said Rabbit solemnly, I went to see Christopher Robin. He was out. Pinned on his door was a notice. The same notice. A different one. But the meaning was the same. It's very odd. Amazing, said Al, looking at the notice again and getting, just for a moment, a curious sort of feeling that something had happened to Christopher Robin's back. What did you do? Nothing. The best thing, said Al wisely. Well, said Rabbit again, as Al knew he was going to. Exactly, said Al. For a little while, he couldn't think of anything more, and then all of a sudden, he had an idea. Tell me, Rabbit, he said, the exact words of the first notice. This is very important. Everything depends on this. The exact words of the first notice. It was just the same as that one, really. Al looked at him and wondered whether to push him off the tree, but feeling that he could always do it afterwards, he tried once more to find out what they were talking about. Okay, sorry, I just had to take a moment because that always makes me giggle so hard. So it turns out Christopher Robin hasn't been around because he's in school in the mornings. He's getting an education. Eeyore knew this, but of course nobody asked him. Eeyore demonstrates his knowledge of Christopher Robin's education by making an A with sticks. But then Rabbit knows what Eeyore has made, and Eeyore is disappointed that he's not the only one who knew. Clever, said Eeyore scornfully, putting a foot heavily on his three sticks. Education, said Eeyore bitterly, jumping on his six sticks. What is learning? asked Eeyore, as he kicked his twelve sticks into the air. A thing Rabbit knows. Ha! Ah. The three to the six to the twelve, it's subtle, and you might not actually notice it at first. Basically, Eeyore, it's, it's snark. It's basically just snark. Uh, this is the one with Pooh Sticks. This is where Pooh invents the game of Pooh Sticks. And while they're playing Pooh Sticks, they see something large and gray floating from under the bridge, which, of course, none of them dropped in. It's Eeyore, and he has fallen into the river. So Pooh, the bear of very little brain, comes up with an idea to get him out again. So soon he was standing among them again on dry land. Oh, Eeyore, you are wet, said Piglet, feeling him. Ewer shook himself and asked somebody to explain to Piglet what happened when you had been inside a river for quite a long time. Other stories include where Tigger is unbounced. This is another big idea of rabbits, that Tigger bounces too much. He, it was probably his fault that he bounced too close to Eeyore, made him jump, and accidentally fall into the river. So it's becoming a problem, Rabbit decides. So they must come up with a plan to unbounce Tigger. It goes about as well as the stealing rue bit from the first book. Then we have the high winds in the forest. Well, as many of us know, high winds can sometimes cause older trees to fall over. And that's exactly what happens with Owl's house. The wind causes the tree to fall over. Pooh and Piglet have been visiting Owl, and it falls over right on his door. So they have to figure out a way to get out. Piglet, it turns out, is the only one who can get out. He gets out through the mailbox, and it helps that he's a very small animal and very brave, really. And then we have another line, which I love to quote myself. Oh, said Pooh, I have thought of something. Astute and helpful bear, said Owl. Pooh looked proud at being called a stout and helpful bear and said modestly that he just happened to think of it. Now, as we have seen, all these animals are friends. And they do not hesitate to come to each other's aid. That is a wonderful lesson to take from these books. And Piglet does perhaps the most noble thing of all. Because since Owl's house has fallen over, Owl has no place to live. Eeyore, who doesn't hang out with the other animals so much, he mostly keeps to himself in his field. He has been looking about, trying to help Owl and find him a place to live. He comes to the others and says, I found him a house. 
He takes them to it. It's Piglet's house. He doesn't realize that. And everyone's just kind of speechless, like, oh, what's Piglet going to do? And he was looking around like, did I do something wrong? So Piglet speaks up and he says, of course, it's the perfect house for Owl. But then, of course, Piglet will be homeless. So Christopher Robin voices the question very tactfully. Well, he said at last, it's a very nice house. And if your own house is blown down, you must go somewhere else, mustn't you, Piglet? What would you do if your house was blown down? Before Piglet could think, Pooh answered for him. He'd come and live with me, said Pooh. Wouldn't you, Piglet? Piglet squeezed his paw. Thank you, Pooh, he said. I should love to. Oh, boy, a little tear. Mm. And at the very end of the book, we're not bookending this like we did the first one, because in the beginning we jumped right into the Hundred Acre Wood, and there we were. We're just going right into the stories because we're familiar with this place. We don't need the introduction. We don't need the conceit. We understand what's going on, that these are Christopher Robin's imaginary friends, that he's playing with his toys. But at the end of it all, Christopher Robin is growing up. He's beginning to go to school, and he won't have so much time for imaginary games. I like that too, said Christopher Robin. But what I like doing best is nothing. How do you do nothing? asked Pooh, after he had wondered for a long time. Well, it's when people call out at you just as you're going off to do it. What are you going to do, Christopher Robin? And you say, oh, nothing. And then you go and do it. Oh, I see, said Pooh. And then we come back to that after they've played a little. Then suddenly again, Christopher Robin, who was still looking at the world with his chin in his hands, called out, Pooh! Yes, said Christopher Robin. When I'm... when... Pooh! Yes, Christopher Robin. I'm not going to do nothing any more. Never again? Well, not so much. They don't let you. In many kids' books... There will sometimes be very true things like that. There's a little bit of heartache. Because, of course, childhood as adulthood is filled with heartache. And there are things about the world that aren't so good and aren't so happy. And those are important things that you have to learn. It is pointed out that no matter what, he will always have this place. And who... Piglet, the rest of them, will always be there for him. This is why I haven't seen the movie Christopher Robin, um, because <laughs> I would just be a puddle. I would just be a mess. And besides, for me, it's kind of weird to see Christopher Robin grown up, so it's, it's just, that's just me. There has been much speculation on the internet and such um, about how the characters relate to various. Um, issues or emotions or something like that, like Eeyore's depression and Piglet is anxiety and so forth. So different aspects of personality. I don't know if I would say that necessarily, but it's an interesting idea. Also, also some people take it, I think, is a bit too far and say, oh, well, something was wrong with Christopher Robin because he's dealing with all, you know, his emotions through this and they make it all serious. And it's like, maybe, maybe not, but he's a kid. He's playing with his toys. He's making up these imaginary stories and some of them maybe his dad made up and he's continuing them. And it's a kid. It's a kid playing with his toys. That's that's what kids do. They make up they make things up. And maybe that's how they learn about the world. Sure. But it just you, you don't have to make it so serious. <laughs> and on that note, I've also seen things um going through the social media and whatnot, and it kind of bugs me. First of all, there are the misapplied Quotes. There are quite a few of them when it comes to Winnie the Pooh. Oh, this said Pooh and that said Pooh. And no, that's not in the book. It's not an actual quote. It, <laughs> that bothers me. There are so many. I, there are so many things that I could not resist reading just for this video. There are so many good quotes and so many good lines. You don't need to make things up. And then there are things like with swearing. 
that bothers me too when um, somebody edits a Peanuts comic strip or puts in the F word with Pooh and Piglet. And I get the point. They're, they're playing off of it. But at the same time, these are things for children. They're, there's an innocence about them, and I, I hate to ruin that. That's the entire point, is they are meant to be this way. If they were meant to be for adults, then they would be for adults and be tailored in that manner. But it just, you're taking these things that are from a child's perspective and you're purposefully making them grown up. I don't know. I, I feel that it, it ruins it and it's not appropriate whatsoever. Anyway, I'm digressing. I know I do that. I'm sorry. I wanted to leave you with Winnie the Pooh. This also belonged to my father. <laughs> so he has been through the ringer. He was mine from a young age. His eye fell off before I knew him. Look at his nose. It's been like that for ages. His ear, the foot, fell apart when I was a kid. I remember the sawdust coming out. And this is my attempt at a mending job when I was young. Oh, he's been so well loved. And he now sits on a shelf for safety. But he's our Winnie the Pooh. He's always there for us. And I hope you've enjoyed this little look at the classic Winnie the Poohs. What's your favorite Winnie the Pooh story? What memories do you have of it? And if you've never read it before, did this intrigue you? Uh, what made you want to check it out? What other children's stories do you really love? And the dialogue you love to quote, uh, the pictures that stick with you. I'd love to know all that. Put it down in the comments, please. I would love to hear it. Until next time, bye. See you later in the 100 Acre Wood.